Well, hey, church, one more time, will you please help me welcome all of our locations and those watching online right now. I wanna, just wanna welcome all of you. We're so glad that you're with us uh, today, uh, especially if you're in the Jacksonville area, you might be watching from home today. Maybe you lost power last night. There's been a lot of uh, flooding going on this weekend. I wanna let you know I've gotten several like tweets and texts and they've said, Stovall, all I could think about this weekend is how you said it was gonna be just like the days of Noah when <laughs> Jesus returns. I was kinda like, man, I think you missed the point. It really doesn't have anything to do with rain. But uh, we are in a series called The End and we're gonna continue part three of that series today. Before you go uh, to the passages of scripture that we're gonna be discussing today, I do want to speak to all of our women all of our ladies, all of our girls, listen, shine is almost here. It's just about 10 days away, 10 days away. And of course, you've probably seen the promotions. I mean, Priscilla Shire, Christine Kane, Lisa Bevere, Diane Wilson, and of course, your very own Carrie Weems. There's only one Hebrew scholar in that group, and that is my wife. So, but I can't think of a better lineup of speakers, women who are gonna pour uh, into your life. And so uh, make sure that either on the website or in your uh, lobby, you sign up today. We wanna make sure that you get a seat. There's kind of always a mad rush on Shine the last 10 days to seven days before the conference. So make sure that you get signed up. It will be an experience that you don't wanna forget and historic in that it's our first women's conference here in the arena. and. Uh, we're really, really excited about that. And don't worry if you're a guy and you're coming uh, to serve or, or whatever, don't worry. We will have the man cave going on at a secret location, TBA. And so just, just know about that. Okay, if you have your Bibles, you can go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse... 18, in just a moment, Romans 1, 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Remember those three words there, suppress the truth. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Everybody say in them. It's manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Everybody say, to them. For since the creation of the world, his invis invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, now when the Bible's saying that they, it's, it's talking about all people, all people that have ever existed or that ever will exist, that they are without excuse. Today, I'm going to be talking about part three of this series, The End, and we're going to begin looking at the afterlife, and today I specifically want to talk about the underworld. Next Sunday for Mother's Day, I'll be talking about heaven. I want to make sure our mom, for our moms, we're talking about heaven and not talking about hell, okay? So, heaven is next weekend, but kind of these Next two messages, what we've done is we've taken in your questions, and what I've tried to do is kind of summarize them into two, three, four kind of main questions, and then, answer, and then answer them with the message. And so the questions today about hell that I'm going to answer, first of all, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? How many of you ever struggled with that one? I know that I have, and, and a lot, especially when I first started Oh, the Lord, well, I'm glad only two or three of y'all. Everybody else is like, oh yeah, send them to hell. Send them all to hell. I, I <laughs> How could a loving God send anyone to hell? The next question, what happens to people who've never heard the gospel? So if, if everyone, if, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no name given under heaven by which men can be saved, if Jesus is the only way, well, what happens to people who, who have, you know, they've never heard, they didn't even have a chance? And then the next question is, well, what is hell like? What is hell like? Stovall, there's just so many myths and history, you know, and it's like, you know, caves and demons and picks, pitchforks, and what's, what really is hell like? And first of all, I do want to say that in your Bibles, 
the word for hell in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, they'll call it Sheol. Sheol is the Hebrew word for hell. In the New Testament, the Greek word for hell is Hades. In both of those words, in the original context, they mean underworld. Underworld, or what uh, we've, we've come to call today hell. And I know in our kind of modern culture, I mean, now we just say hell for everything, you know, like, oh, hell, you know. I, what, you know, what the hell? And I remember I had one of my, one of my grandmothers, she'd always, so we'd, get, we'd be out driving and she'd always say, look at that person, they driving like a bat out of hell. <laughs> so now we kind of lose, use that word hell for so many things. So kind of what I want to do is I kind of want to just, you know, let's wipe the slate clean and let's, let's look at this subject that Jesus talked very much about, this underworld, this place called hell, and also, you know, who's it for? And if God's so loving, why could he or how could he send anybody there? So I want you to lean in today for the next few moments. When I mean lean in, I need, I mean, man, just pay attention because I want to cover hell. I want to cover it thoroughly. So we're not talking about it next week, okay? And I've entitled this part three message simply, The Underworld. The Underworld. Father, we thank you for your love. Lord, thank you that the gospel is good news. Lord, thank you that, uh, God, you want every single person to experience your love and live forever with you. Lord, I just ask that the Holy Spirit help us today. And through the Spirit and your word, we understand this truth and this place called the underworld in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. The first thing that I want to start off with is just to make it clear, I could you know, give you several scriptures just about the nature and character of God before we unpack this. You know, God is perfectly loving, he is perfectly holy, and he's perfectly just. He's perfectly loving, perfectly holy, and perfectly just. Now, God's being loving, or what we call loving kindness, that flows out of his love. I mean, God is love. In his essence, he is love. His loving kindness flows out of that love, as well as his holiness flows out of that love, as well as his justice flows out of that love. And it's easiest, easy for us to think of, you know, yes, God's merciful and, and his loving kindness, but also you need to remember that really what, what makes God just so awesome and, and just so far above all of us is, is his holiness. That's why he's, he's, he's to be feared, he's, he's to be held in awe, he's to be respected. And many times what we do is it, we can't, it's, it's hard to reconcile, well, okay, he's loving and merciful, but he's, he's holy and just, so how do, the, how do these two tensions work out? How do we reconcile these two things? If he's merciful, why is there, you know, these judgments and things like that? But what I'm hoping to do today is to unpack these questions in a way that you can understand that all of this The afterlife, the underworld, heaven, and everything else, all of this is an outflow of God's love. And that Jesus Christ is the perfect Son of God who showed how much God loves us by what he did on the cross. Remember, do not try to evaluate God's love for you based on your current circumstance or your past experiences. Evaluate God's love for you based on what Jesus did for you on that cross over 2,000 years ago. So he's perfectly loving, perfectly holy, and perfectly just. What I mean by perfectly just is in the end, at the final judgment, no one's going to point a finger at God and say, man, God, you gave that guy a bum deal. Wow, that's rough, God, man. You were tough on it. Like, like, no one's going to say that was wrong, that was unjust. That person never had a chance. We're all going to say, as it says in Revelations, oh, Lord, just and true and righteous are your ways. God will never be accused of being unjust. And it's very important that we understand this Romans 1 18 
through 20 here. Real quickly, let me go over it again. Look, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Say that, suppress the truth. In unrighteousness, because what may be known of God, so it can be known, is manifest, look, in them, only inside of them, for God has shown it past tense. He's shown it to them. And it goes on to say, since the creation of the world, his individual attributes are clearly seen, understood by the things which are made, his eternal powers, God had, so that they, or so that everyone is without excuse. Here's what this scripture is saying, is that every single person that has ever lived on the face of the earth, regardless of race, regardless of what religious brand they have, regardless of where they live, how they live, or their circumstances, every single person that has ever lived or ever will live on this planet, God has made himself known to them God created the heart. Don't you think the creator of the heart knows how to speak to the heart? God created the conscience. Don't you think the creator of the conscience knows how to speak to the conscience? Every single person, God is constantly drawing them, revealing himself to them, getting them to to respond to this truth that there is a God who loves them and who has made them, and any person that responds to that truth and does not suppress that truth will find the truth, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, it's so powerful how God deals with the hearts of men and women that the natural default of them just being open to God and open to the truth is gonna lead them to the truth, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has shown it to them, He has put it in them. He is speaking to them through a variety of ways. And for people actually to not accept God, they actually have to suppress that truth. They have to suppress it, which is the wrath of God revealed in the unrighteousness of men. So when you see someone living all crazy and living a lifestyle that's against God, what that shows you is that they are suppressing the truth of Jesus lovingly drawing them into a relationship with God. Every single person that is open in any way, shape, or form to what the real truth is, what the meaning of life is, and while you are here, why you are here, and what is your purpose and meaning, you will find that. That's why there's so many scriptures in the Bible where Jesus says, look, everyone who asks receives. Everyone, that's not for believers. Everyone, anyone who knocks, the door's gonna be open. Look what it says here in Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, and you will seek me and find me, look, when you search for me with all of your heart. Now that language there, all of your heart, that doesn't mean like, oh, I'm on a quest for God. You know, let me shave my head and put on a robe and get a staff and go up to a mountain somewhere. 